let's talk about game design. I want to give some caveats at the beginning. I am not an expert on this. I have made automated games in the past, but I'm just sharing some thoughts I've had over the years, and we're not going to do a super deep dive into this stuff. I just like talking about game design. So let's jump right in. Why would you even want automation in a game? And I've listed out three categories here that I think make for good candidates, doing difficult tasks, doing boring or repetitive tasks, or what I'm calling expanding your scale, which is doing more of something or doing it for longer. These are not mutually exclusive, so you might have a boring, difficult task that you need to do over the course of about a week, in which case all the more reason to have automation in your game. What this boils down to is things you either don't want to do or things you can't do. So you might not want to do a difficult task and you might not be able to play a game for a week straight, so that's why you might want automation in a game. Let's break down each of these categories and we'll start with difficult tasks. The first example that I have is Dance Dance Revolution. This was a game that was actually played with a dance pad that you would control with your feet. So arrows would rise from the bottom of the screen, and when they aligned with these gray arrows at the top, you would press the corresponding pad with your foot. So very much a rhythm game, but you could also kind of consider it to be a memory game because maybe some of the levels were so fast that you weren't just reacting to the arrows, you were more basing it on your muscle memory that you acquired over practicing the game. That brings us into the second system I have here, which is memory intensive systems. I put an example here of combos and fighting games. Sub-Zero and Mortal Kombat Trilogy to do one of his finishing moves was high punch, low kick, high kick, low punch, and then seven other button inputs, which to me sounds ridiculous, but I remember trying this out a long, long time ago. And it can be tough to remember this sort of thing. And this is just one combo in the game. There are precision-based systems. These are ones that involve dexterity. Classic example is just any shooter game aiming and shooting at something. And typically it's not a stationary target like a traffic cone, but it's a moving person. So that adds the complexity that you have. The final thing that I have listed out here, I mentioned earlier that there's difficulty, boring tasks, and then expanding your scale. But difficulty plays into the scale aspect of this. This is StarCraft II, and pictured on the bottom here are 12 of these blue units. If you were to control any one of them, it would probably be very easy. You would point and click, and you'd either move or attack. But controlling all 12 of them at once while you're managing a base, while you have other armies elsewhere, and trying to keep all of these alive can be very, very tough. So these are all candidates for automation and why you might want to handle them, but that all fits into difficult tasks. So now let's take a look at boring tasks. These are all very subjective. So something that you might find boring, I might find very exciting or vice versa. The first example I have here is Final Fantasy 1. Just doing battle in Final Fantasy 1 can be tedious. I sort of joke that this game could have been called A Button Simulator because I'm pretty sure you could just pick the fight action regardless of your character or the enemies and probably win every single fight and eventually beat the game. There is the classic example of mining or gathering resources in a game. So this is Minecraft and we have some diamond nodes here. Just hunting these down, having to carve your way through a bunch of walls, that can be boring for some people and might be something you'd want to automate. And then I think maybe one of the most divisive examples is fishing in games. You cast out your bobber, you wait for it to wiggle and you click it and you get a fish. That for some people is relaxing, meditative, maybe you get in this zen-like state and for other people it's just a barrier that you have to overcome to play the game. You could really name any system or mechanic you could think of because someone out there is going to find it boring and might want to automate it. The final thing that I had here was expanding scale, and this is pretty quick. It's either doing more of something. So for example, let's say I'm playing World of Warcraft and I've got one character. Well, what if I had five characters or 40 characters? Then I could get even more rewards for my entire account. And then the longer part of things is doing something when you're unable to do it. So maybe you're at work and you can't play the game, or maybe you're sleeping. Well, wouldn't it be nice if the game just played itself and still gave you those rewards? And so this is a setup I just found on the internet. I counted 10 mice in this picture. But yeah, this is someone who would probably benefit from a game that was just automated to begin with and didn't need such a complex setup. So those are all three of the categories that I defined for why would you have automation. And ideally, you're automating games in a way that enhances the fun. But I have this note here about don't automate out the fun. And I've got kind of a weird example for this. Imagine in Super Smash Bros, if you made this an automated game, what would it look like? And I honestly don't really know what it would look like because I think it would cut out the fun of the game. The fun is sitting there with your friends or competing with other people and reacting to what they're doing and coming up with a battle plan of how you're going to beat them. And if you automated this, you actually could play Super Smash Bros by turning four computer players on and just having them battle each other. But then what's the goal of the game? Is it to bet on the outcome? Are you raising a character or something? So you need to drastically change the nature of the game to apply automation to it. And that's kind of what I mean when I say don't automate out the fun. You can't just add it to any game and have it work. So how do we work automation into games? And I want to look through each of these categories and figure out how we might do that. Let's start with difficult tasks. 
This one was a bit of a conundrum for me, and I'm going to lead you through my stream of consciousness here. What happens in general when you automate a difficult task? Well, let's look at those manually controlled games from earlier. Dance Dance Revolution, suppose I handed you an automated device, you hook it up to your dance pad, and now when one of these arrows reaches the top, it just automatically plays the right pad for you. It wouldn't really even be a game anymore at that point. It would essentially be like watching a movie of the perfect game playing out every time because you wouldn't have any inputs anymore. You would have just automated out the difficulty of the game entirely. And you'd also be automating out the fun of the game. Sure, it might be interesting to watch a perfect game play out once for a song you had a really hard time beating, but what about the 10th time or the 100th time? Likewise, with Team Fortress 2, imagine if I gave you an aimbot. It just immediately points at the right thing and maybe even shoots for you. You would just be able to move through the world and destroy everything in your path. So that's a way of automating out the difficulty, but it doesn't really make the game fun. So how do you create a game where you've automated difficult tasks and still have it be fun? And I think this depends on how you define difficulty. So I started thinking about factory games like Satisfactory and Factorio. These are games where you typically start, you're collecting some basic resource and building small machines, maybe moving resources around or repositioning machines. And as you go through the game, you're no longer doing those initial tasks, but you're building more of a sprawling factory to handle all this for you. But are those difficult tasks that you were automating? Was collecting ore difficult? Was moving a resource difficult? I would argue that they were boring tasks that you're overcoming, which is the next category we'll talk about. These games are difficult, but they're difficult for different reasons. It's typically a placement and optimization and management kind of difficulty than it is the actual tasks that you're automating being difficult. So then I thought about puzzle games. Pictured here is the lost mind of Dr. Brain, and the goal was to move this scientist to every brain in the grid and pick it up. The interface that you had for doing this was these actions down here. So here we have move, move, turn left, move. So the character would go move, move, turn left, and then move. And what you had to do is add in another move and a pickup, and that way you'd pick up this brain. What you're doing though is you're just solving that one puzzle. It's not like you're coming up with a generalized solution for this. So every time you complete a level, that solution you already had will no longer work. So I think you could argue that figuring out the puzzle is difficult, and you could probably argue that even getting the automation to work is a little bit difficult. So is this an example of automating a difficult task? And my conclusion is, I don't really know. I think it comes down to terminology, but I think the fun of these games would be that you have an initially difficult task that you've automated to the point where it is now not even a speed bump for you. The next category is a bit easier to reason about because like I said earlier, boringness is subjective. So you could sort of think about it like any automated game has already chosen a boring system in their minds and they've automated it out. The game that I wanna highlight is Final Fantasy XII. I have not actually played this game, but my understanding of the Gambit system is that you had a set of conditions on the left and a set of actions on the right. And these were for each of your characters. So just reading out one of these lines, if my ally is at low life, then heal them. So great, this is something that is tedious for a lot of players, which is managing all of your characters in a battle system, when typically you have an easy to articulate strategy that you want to apply to practically every battle. So why not just have them do this on their own? And that's where the fun of this comes from, is not having to do those boring tasks. Like I said, I did not play this game. And my understanding was that it wasn't very well received. I think people back then were mostly asking the question of like, if I'm automating this, then what am I doing with the game? How am I playing it? And we'll come back to that later. <laughs> the final thing that I wanted to talk about here is automating for expanding scale. The perfect example here is simulation games where it's just you're automating things because it's fun to watch and you get to do things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do on your own. Good examples of this are any game with the word sim in it, the sim, sim city, typically idle games. Pictured here is The Sims, I think maybe The Sims 4. And we see three different Sims in this picture and they had various needs just like in real life. If they got hungry, then they would need to eat. If they got tired, they would need to go sleep. And the game exposed an autonomy option in their gameplay settings here. You could choose, do you want it to be on or off? And if it was off, you had to manually input all of the actions for all of your Sims. And if it was on, then they could just decide to do things on their own if they wanted to. And it's obscured by this screenshot, but right beneath this is disable autonomy for selected sim. This was just a checkbox. So if you had eight sims, you could have seven of them be autonomous. And then the one that you wanted to control, you could give it its own actions. So this is a really good marriage of manual control and automation. And it's the perfect case of expanding your scale because I can't control eight different things in real time. And I probably don't want to keep pausing the game to give them exactly the actions I want. And maybe sometimes I just want to eat lunch myself and just watch the game play itself for 10 minutes. So this had a great solution to all of those things by giving automation to your Sims when you wanted it and being able to take that ability away or override it. 
If we consider an axis of fully manually controlled games all the way to fully automated games, then where along that axis does your game lie? And I showed some games that have automation, but they're not fully automated games. And so what if we cranked up the automation? And that's where we start to get into these automation heavy or auto battler kinds of games, games like Team Fight Tactics or Hearthstone Battlegrounds. These, by virtue of being automation heavy, means that they are not manual heavy, which means that we've cut down the player input pretty drastically. But the player still needs to do something. And the way these typically work is that there's a preparation phase, something where you get to set up your initial strategy or making some choices that you have. And then you get to adjust it in these in-between stages. Maybe there are phases of the battle and you get to control them at certain points. It's very important with these that you actually have some strategy and you get to watch it impact the game. Because if not, it would feel more like it's a simulation playing out and that your choices were meaningless. And the way that you figure out if your choices were impactful is by getting some feedback. There needs to be some sense of, okay, that choice was a good choice. And now I know that I can build on that in the next time that I'll get input. On that note of automation heavy games, I want to pivot here to a case study essentially of a prototype that I've been working on. The goal that I had was to make an automated battler in the style of old school RPGs. And ideally it would be fun. So let's take a look at a demo of this. To start with, remember that this is just a prototype. I'm just going to guide you through this pretty quickly and it'll give us a foundational point from which we can talk about a lot of these systems. The way that this worked is you would pick a character to start with, in this case I have a mage, and you could move around in this overworld and you could get into battles. Battles played out in a fully automated way. So here, every time you see this cooldown bar fill up, it's using the ability that corresponds to the button that's being selected. And then you could eventually unlock more characters. So here I'll have the warrior and here I'll have the necromancer and they could all get into battles. And so I'll zoom out a little bit here and we see three different battles playing out. So that's it. That's the foundation of this game. Just kind of keep this in mind as we talk about this. I'm going to intentionally stop myself from talking for too long about this. And we're going to try to focus on just two things, the battle strategy and player choice of that prototype. I want to start with battle strategy and I have a thought experiment for you. Let's say I handed you Pokemon and I said, I want you to play this game and get to level 99 in the starter zone. In fact, just in these 10 tiles of grass. As far as I understand, nothing in the game stops you from doing this. There's a town just south of here where you can go and heal, and I'm pretty sure you can get into battles right around here, and I don't think there's ever a cutoff for experience that you gain. So yeah, why not get to level 99? And there are pretty obvious reasons why not. It's just not a good use of your time. It's boring. There's no real reason. It's not like the game is that tough and you need to get to level 99 to begin with. So, okay, obvious reasons, but Pokemon is a manually played game. And because it's manually played, the battle system needed to be interesting enough. I'm not going to read out this slide. The whole point of this is just the battle system is interesting. It's not the simplest. It's not the most complex. It exists. It's there. It's got some choices in it. So now suppose you automated Pokemon. I give you some way of expressing a battle strategy. Maybe you can write code and you write the code for your battle strategy that you have. Well, with this automation comes the concept of good enough. And to illustrate this, imagine three strategies you might code. One is really simple. It's just randomly pick a move. So here we have tackle, gust, and sand attack. Maybe you use tackle, tackle, sand attack, tackle. That could be the strategy that plays out. Maybe you have a predetermined order for the moves, and maybe you try to play optimally the way that a human player would. You use the right moves in the right situation. How do you rate how good a strategy is? And the biggest question to answer is, well, did I win? Because if you lost, then clearly it wasn't a good strategy at all. So let's assume that you won. Well, then what do you base it on? Maybe the number of turns it took to win, maybe how your Pokemon are doing afterward. And so let's just boil this down to how long did it take you to win? And we could even say it's in real time or in turns. And I'm just making up numbers here. Let's say that playing optimally, you win in four turns. And by just randomly picking a move, you win in eight turns. So the difference between the best strategy and the worst strategy we have here is a factor of 2x. Are you incentivized if you've got that random strategy of going for the optimal strategy? And yeah, to some extent you are. Maybe it's not fun to play suboptimally. Maybe you've got the time. Maybe there's some other reason that you're pursuing this. You want to learn the automation system. But a 2x difference is not so vast because you're automating it. So you could just step away from your computer or your Game Boy or something, and it would just still play this out. And the difference is 10 minutes versus 20 minutes or one week versus two weeks. For a moment though, let's jump over to the idle game world. These are games that typically have just infinite growth of stats and progression. So here is a picture of Tap Titans, where there is a boss that has 6.16 times 10 to the nearly 5,000th power. And for fun, I wrote out what this number is here. 
this is unfathomable. We don't have a frame of reference for what a number this big is. And most humans probably don't think very well beyond a billion or a trillion or something like that, let alone a number this large. And so with these games, you do typically have a bigger difference between your floor and your ceiling. And again, I'm making up numbers here, but imagine your best strategy wins in five turns and your worst one wins in 5,000 turns. Well, now there's a 1,000 time difference. And now something that would have taken 10 minutes will take about a week. So in this case, are you incentivized to come up with a better strategy? And like a thousand times, yes, because would you want to take an extra seven days doing something that you could accomplish in 10 minutes? Almost certainly not. And even though the game is automated and you could just set down your phone or your Game Boy or whatever for seven days, you still, it feels good to make progress and you still want to see that play out. I have a couple of simple conclusions here. If the difference between the strategy floor and the strategy ceiling is huge, then players will be incentivized to do better. They might not actually do better, but they'll at least be incentivized to do better. And this is true for every game, not just automation games. If you were playing some card game and you could be a thousand times better than you currently are, there's a pretty good motivation to be better at it. But if I said you could only be 10% better, eh, maybe you're like, that's good enough, I'll just stop. With automation games though, I think players are more likely to stop earlier on because they'll, they might have a good enough strategy and getting something better might be difficult or tedious for them because you could always just leave the game running in the end. Back to my prototype, I had two very important questions. One is, how deep should the battle system be, keeping all of what I just talked about in mind? And two is, is that system fun? And my answer to the first question of how deep should it be is just enough to add some interest. I really don't think you need it to be super deep, given the automation is going to smooth out those differences anyway, and that people will find their good enough point. And I don't want to make a system that has a 1000x difference between the worst and the best. Regarding is the system fun, I shared out a form with the game when I shared the prototype and I got 36 responses back and the very first question was I had fun playing the game and then the Likert scale of strongly agree down to strongly disagree. And about 70% of the people said that they agreed that the game is fun. And that was a very rough around the edges prototype. There weren't projectiles and effects and all this other stuff that you might expect. So I think the game shows enough promise to want to develop into an actual game. Quick caveat, I glossed over a whole bunch of stuff, just like how I'm going to gloss over this slide, so that we can focus on the second thing here, which is going to go much faster, which is player choice. So there are two slides I want to bring up again. One is the bit I said about automation heavy games and how they drastically reduce player input just by virtue of being automation heavy and not manual heavy. And the second slide where we had this question for Final Fantasy 12 of if I'm automating all the battles, then what am I as a player doing? And so I do think this is a problem. If there's just a battle system, it's not really enough. And some of the feedback that I got from the game, I got those 36 responses, they pointed to that. There were more questions than just, did you have fun? And my solution was, well, add another system. So now there's gonna be a town and item selling in the game. And the way it'll work is you win those battles that you saw in the original prototype and they'll give you items. Then you sell those items in your town and then you use the money to upgrade both your town and the battler. So now there's an interesting feedback loop that happens where the stronger your battlers get, the more items you get, which means more money, which means the stronger your battlers get. And these two systems of town and battles can feed into each other. And that closes the loop on the couple things I wanted to talk about here. If that game sounds fun to you, running a town and battling and improving your town, then you should join my Discord. There will be a playable demo probably mid-year. I really didn't want this video to be plugging the game, which is why I'm not even mentioning the name of it. It really was just to talk about game design. My conclusions from all this, I think automated games are really interesting because it flips the entire history of video games on its head, essentially. Everyone's used to manually controlled games and the picture you have in your head when you think video games is someone sitting with a mouse and keyboard or with a controller and playing a game. But an automated game, while they're still probably using those inputs, is a little bit different in how they're interacting with the game. I also just kind of like talking about this, although this video was very hard to put together. For whatever reason, it took more than eight hours. And so I hope you liked it. I'm just going to keep talking about stuff on this channel that I find interesting and that I hope you get some value out of. Hope you have a good rest of your day. See ya.